the administrator for the MAPS, Michigan Automated Prescription System, the state of Michigan's prescription monitoring program, and has held this position since the program's inception with legislation in 2002. He is responsible for implementation, training, analysis, and research. Mr. Whistle is the Secretary for the Controlled Substances Advisory Commission and the Drug Control Administrator for the State of Michigan. Mr. Whistle is also responsible for management of the pharmacy inspectors and serves on the Board of Pharmacy Rules Committee. Mr. Whistle has been a licensed pharmacist for 32 years and worked in a variety of settings including hospital pharmacy, retail pharmacy, and as a pharmacy inspector since 1994. Mr. Whistle is a 1978 graduate of Howard University's College of Pharmacy and completed his pharmacy internship at Georgetown University Hospital Pharmacy. Let's welcome Mr. Michael Whistle. Our objective today is to give you a working knowledge of maps, what its strengths and limitations are, so that when you speak to physicians and in detail regarding their use of maps, that you can do so intelligently and with a lot of foreknowledge because you will often be questioned about why why do we use maps, what's it to, what does it, it do, how do we use it, is it difficult to use, and so forth. And I want to give you as much information as I can today so that you can answer those questions. First of all, I want to talk about what's exempt from reporting. This, is, this helps to identify what its limitations are. Um, many cases are administered directly to patients are exempt. That would be, for instance, in a veterinarian's office when they apply a fentanyl patch to, to an animal, that would not be reported because it's administered there in the office. If a physician gave a patient a shot of uh, a parity, that would also be exempt from reporting. Um, this will also include patients in hospitals and nursing homes. Those people would not have their medications reported either. However, patients who are in uh, non-medical institutions such as assisted living, uh, adult foster care, those medications would be reported because they're not administered by licensed professionals. It's called skilled care versus not skilled care. Um, dispensing for up to a 40 hour supply from the medical facility. This occurs a lot in hospital emergency rooms, especially up north, where there's not a lot of pharmacies that are open after hours. Sometimes the ER docs will dispense a small amount of controlled substance and carry them over until they can get their own medication the next day. Schedule 5 exempt narcotics are also not reported. That would be things like coating cough syrups that people sign for. Control substance samples. Uh, at one time there were a lot more samples than there are now, but we're down to only a few now, uh, such as Loridia and I think Ampli and CR. Those would not be reported either. The VA does not report, they never have. Um, it's kind of interesting, the federal government is encouraging PMPs or prescription monitoring programs, but the VA has not reported yet. Um, we're working with them on a national level to try to get them to report. I suspect that one of the reasons maybe they don't have the technology in place to report for all, all, 40, all 50 states. We don't have programs in all 50 states yet. There's only two that don't at least have legislation. But there's about 35 programs right now that are up and running. And as you know, Florida was just added recently, which is probably the state that needed the program the most. Methanol treatment centers don't report the take home doses. Remember, they, mostly what they do, though, is they administer methanol on a daily basis to patients. But a patient who's been in the treatment center for a period of time is allowed to take home meds for the weekends and holidays. Those don't get reported either, and that's because there's special privacy provisions in the Code of Federal Regulations under CFR 42. Sometimes we'll get a call from a physician who's upset because a patient shows positive for methadone, but it's not in apps. Whenever that happens, make sure you remind them to check the patient may be going to a methadone treatment center. Now, the methadone treatment centers are required to form action reports by the people that license them, and that's a good thing because these, are, these tend to be the patients who have already been have a problematic with drug conversion. So make sure when you see that opposite effect, when the methadone shows up, check the methadone, see if they're in a methadone treatment center. Also, practitioner dispensing Suboxone or Semitex. Um, the manufacturer, Bank Kaiser, Bank Ring Kaiser, has some patient and need programs in place, so sometimes they will supply physicians with medication to dispense to their patients. When that occurs, it's not reported in advance because it's dispensed under the CFR 42 privacy provision. However, if the doc writes a prescription, then it does get reported to MAPS. And most docs do write scripts, they don't dispense. Because most docs really don't like to dispense controlled substances. There's a lot of reporting requirements and problems associated with that. Now, access. Health professional boards, that would be 
Board of Nursing, Board of Pharmacy, Board of Medicine. The reason they have access, although it's indirectly, is whenever we have a question or complaint about a health professional who's not doing things correctly, say a pharmacy who's delivering you know, substances to a pharmacist, or perhaps a physician who's not prescribing correctly. Uh, under that case, we will investigate for the various boards because we're their umbrella agency. And uh, we will then provide a page to the board to make a determination as far as sanctions with the license. Um, the employers in the firm will include us as employees to look for that information as well as access it. Also, uh, state federal municipal employee whose duty is to enforce drug laws, they have a special uh, access site called the LEO, Law Enforcement Officer. Now, this isn't the same as a practitioner access site. The practitioner site is automated, it's open 24 7. As long as you certify that it's for the bona fide treatment of the patient, you get the report. Law enforcement has to get on a separate access site after they've been, uh, after they've been uh, vetted and make their question uh, as far as probable cause, who they want data on and why they want it. That's all reviewed before we release it. Generally, uh, with the feds, they're looking at either a pharmacy or a practitioner. Local law enforcement is usually looking at an individual, uh, say someone who's been caught, maybe they had a car accident, they found drugs in their pocket, they can't account for it. They would then come to us and ask to see if they have a prescription for it. Um, just so you know, we get about 2,500 requests a day, and only about 1 or 2% are law enforcement. Uh, 98, 97 to 98% are physicians, and then maybe 1 or 2% pharmacies, and then the rest, which is only 1 or 2% is law enforcement. But we check everyone before we release the information because it's so critical uh, that in some certain cases they have the information, others where they shouldn't really have access to it. Now, Medicaid uh, pretty much has unrestricted access. If they come to us and say, we have a Medicaid recipient, we want their data, we give it to them, they don't really, really need a reason for it. Stay with the practitioner. As long as Medicaid's involved, the law allows us to share that information. In fact, they're the only one that seems to have, that they, they appear to have the best access of anyone. Because it clearly states in the statute that we can share with them. Now, this is the most prevalent use. Practitioner or pharmacy certifies any for the truth of a modified current patient. Every time they pull a report, they have to make that certification. And that's, like I say, about 98% of our and then for anybody else in law enforcement has to use for modified drug related criminal investigatory or evidentiary purposes. What this means is they can't just do searches based on what they think might have occurred. Say somebody died of a drug overdose, we need to check everybody who got this drug in the last two weeks. That's not the kind of searches they do. They wouldn't have a reason before they came to us. And so it's important that we all understand that there's, there's systems and places, it's all guided by state law as well as federal law as to who we can give access to, why, when, and where. Now, this is something we added in the board rule in 2007. Positive ID is required for the pharmacist or pharmacy employee who an unknown person who controls up to start suspense or delivered to. Now, we were very cautious to use the term suspense or delivered to because oftentimes it's not the patient who shows up with the substance. In that case, you would ask to see the ID of the person you're delivering it to. However, if you're going to put something into your computer as far as an ID, make sure it's the one that belongs to the patient, not the person you're delivering it to. Positive ID usually is a driver's license, are exceptions. And the reason we go with driver's license is because it really fulfills all of your data needs at once. You have a name, you have a date of birth, you have an address, and you have an ID number. That's everything you need to identify that patient. We put that in a database. Uh, there's also a way that you can search by patient ID if you don't have the correct patient. If you do a search based on a patient's name and date of birth, you can't find him. There is a provision where you can search by their, their ID. Now in the past, up until about 07, 06, we were collecting social security numbers. Since then, we're collecting driver's license numbers. If they don't have it, they can put zeros in. And the same applies for someone under the age of 16, just put zeros in. There's also provisions where if they can find an application for that person, they believe the script is legitimate, they can still fill it. Again, put zeros in. Um, when we first started up, we noticed something called doctor shopping right away when we became, when we became live in 2003. And back around 2007, 2008, we started looking at monthly reports in a PDF format of people who were seeing six or more doctors and getting six or more prescriptions. Now, the reason we chose six is we are from other states, and that seemed to be the number where we pretty much well assured that anybody with that number of hires is probably just doctor shopping. Generally, it's not legitimate patients. And so far, as far as I know, uh, we haven't had a legitimate patient yet. But we also noticed people were seeing 27 doctors a month and getting 27 scripts. And if you think about the timeline when practitioners are open, that means that they're seeing some doctors two or three a day. And we noticed it wasn't just small amounts, it was very large amounts. And 
generally was things like oxycontin, hydrocodone products, as well as uh, the appraisal and other kinds of Initially, we had 255 shoppers, which is a lot of people. Um, then we looked at 10 or more, because we were doing this manually at the time, 130 shoppers, and that's what we decided to start with. And we mail letters manually every month, where every time a patient popped up, they had to run that patient's profile, and then mail letters out to the 30 or 40 doctors they had seen in the last several months. So you can see that over the course of the day, you mail out thousands of letters, and you can keep up. This is kind of what the report looked like. It's a PDF format. Names and uh, take away the names. We have like a date of birth. Um, we have an area that we're in, zip code, as well as a number of scripts. And this is a very labor intensive system we were using originally. Um, we mail it monthly. Of course, most drop patients. Uh, you know, if someone's seeing 27 doctors a month, there's probably more going on there than just drip version. Um, we started at 10 or more. And over the course of about a year, we sent out about 4,400 surveys. Along with the letters, we got 1,700 back, 39% return rate which I thought was pretty good. And we keep those surveys. And the question ever comes up with practitioners will go back and, and review them to see what they told us. Um, now, Dr. Shoppers, more recently, when we started looking at it after a year, we noticed that the numbers are going way down. The highest was only 15. We went from 255 to 42. And 10 or more was from 130 to 10, which was 99% reduction. But remember, that's after a year. We only got letters every month. So it was effective, although it was labor intensive. And then after a year or so, we lost that student assistant and we stopped sending letters out. And guess what happened? The numbers went right back up over the course of about a year. So the notification was effective. Um, we only sent out letters, not reports. A lot of states will actually send the patient report. We send the letter because we want doctors to sign up for maps. If we gave them a report, they could address the patient and do nothing else. This way, in order for them to look at that data, they have to pull the report log into maps, create a password, become a user, then they can pull the report and the patient. Most of those who were dropped up appear to be selling. They're a very high utilization group. And the other thing we noticed too is they usually have multiple, multiple methods of payment. Usually there'd be two or three, sometimes four different types of insurance. Um, the numbers didn't creep up. We even had some to call and complain about it. That's how we knew it was working. The shoppers are calling us to complain because we're violating their civil rights. We must be um, somebody even asked what the threshold was. So they're, they're a pretty intelligent group. Um, we got a $20,000 grant this year. Well, actually, it was early this year. We implemented an automated system. This is what I want to talk about in a few minutes. The first one, we sent out almost 1,600 letters. And we were able to get the list at six or more because now that it's automated, we can send those letters out. And we've been sending out about 1,600 letters a month. Um, 34 was the sharp list of 10 more. 25 to 300 a month on the manual process. You can see it's a big difference now. We can send out 15, 1600 letters a month. And the list is also in Excel now. And the nice thing about Excel is you can sort that. And we started sorting based on position. And so we had some positions we were sending uh, 30 and 40 letters to. That means there were 30 and 40 shoppers going to them in a single month. We had one guy with 50 letters. So obviously these docs are not full of national reports. And they're probably doing some other things that they shouldn't be doing. So we started looking at we started looking at these positions more specifically, and we even had one position right back and said that it wasn't any responsibility. We wrote it down. Um, basically, we're doing use of addiction. Sometimes it's both. Um, and then, as you know, legislation was passed uh, almost a year ago to make doctor shopping a felony, but it does allow the court to place that person in a drug rehab program, uh, just like we have an HPR fee for health professionals, health professional recovery program where. If you, if you fulfill the requirements, uh, you, you stay out of jail, but you do have to go get addiction services. A lot of different names for them. Um, we, we've always focused on the prescriber rather than the pharmacy, and the reason for that is very simple. Um, once that prescription is written and the patient has that paper in hand, they can go to any pharmacy they want. And even if, as a pharmacist, you decline to fill their prescription, first of all, you know there's going to be a fight, an argument. Then they're going to complain to management about you. But even after all that, if you prevail, they can still take that prescription and go down the street. And Dr. Shopper's network, they know who fills scripts about aspirin and who doesn't. So we felt it might be better to intervene at the prescriber level because if the physician doesn't write the prescription, nobody else has to fight with that patient. It might be a little difficult at the doctor's office, but that's where it ends. So that's why we focused on the prescriber in most cases rather than the pharmacy. Although we do encourage pharmacists to 
pull reports and look because sometimes we can't get the practitioner to do the right thing. In that case, then it falls upon you. And that would be in some cases that actually decline the prescription. Uh, I'm not recommending if that happens that you keep the prescription because that can often precipitate an unfortunate event. But if you can't fill a prescription for a patient because of doctor shopping activity or because of the criminal abuse, if you look at 338.490, it's called professional responsibility, that does list the reasons when you should not. It says should not fill a prescription. Not, not may not, shall not. So if you believe it's not for a legitimate medical purpose, you're obligated not to fill that prescription. Pharmacists and the police, and the there's a position. Uh, actually, nobody should be a police here. However, sometimes you, you do have to confirm with a patient, and that can lead to threats and intimidation. That's why I tell you, don't ever try to keep the prescription or, or do anything to endanger yourself or your staff. Um, always think about that. If you don't want to endanger your life. life. Um, and also, the physician doesn't write the script. We don't have the other issues. Although that doesn't prevent them from going to multiple positions. And see, that's where it comes into place to use maps. If, if everybody was using maps, we wouldn't see this kind of doctor shopping going on. Granted, we'd probably see other ways they would try to get medication, such as breaking into pharmacies or, or, or internet shopping, you know, that sort of thing. But we wouldn't see the doctor shopping as prevalent as we have. This is the letter that we've been sending out. And as you can see, it identifies that patient, but then it gives the physician options as to what they can do. So you find a lot of physicians that have gotten at least one of these letters. And in most cases, one letter is all it takes. They become aware of maps, they start pulling reports, and we don't have to notify them again. The question that comes up is why are we sending some practitioners 30 letters? And then the next month, 30 more. Well, there's some reasons for that, which we're going to get into in a minute. But anyway, we don't, we don't tell them what to do. We give them very, very, very clear options as to what they can do. However, in most cases, unfortunately, they think they do have to copy of that letter in our packet? Now, the Controlled Substance Commission has made some recommendations in the past. Uh, one was license or registration for pharmacy technicians. There's only seven states left that don't, and we're one of the lucky ones. Um, also, we studied DEA 106 laws for quite a period of time. Anybody who has a, a loss of a controlled substance has to fill a 106 laws report for the DEA as well as the Board of Pharmacy. And what we noticed when we looked at it over a period of time was that major diversion was oxycodone or hydrocodone in pharmacy. But that in retail chain pharmacies, the majority of the cases it was a technician. Either the pharmacist went to the bathroom or they went to the last bed and took something, but it was usually a technician. When we looked at independent pharmacies, we noticed it was usually a night break in, occasionally a pharmacist, but, but generally technicians seem to be the biggest source of problem. And without licensing technicians, they can go to the pharmacy, get another job, and nobody knows. That's one of the reasons why we wanted to be licensed to be totally accountable when things are missing. And again, the Dr. Sharp legislation was pushed through last year. Uh, Blue Cross was a big participant in that uh, because they had so much fraud. They said they lost over a billion dollars last year with prescription and hospital fraud. So this is what it looked like. And then if you want to look it up, there's the statute. But basically what it says, a person shall not fraudulently obtain or attempt to obtain a control substance or a prescription for a control substance from a healthcare provider. It's very clear. Basically, they can't just say they forgot. If you look down here, though, this is the important part. You can't order a screening and a rehab rather than just putting people in jail. It is a felony. Uh, also, the physician patient and dentist patient privilege uh, do not apply, which means that they can get the medical records then. That's important for anybody who needs to get the medical records. Um, the other thing we notice, too, is as we increase schedule two scripts, patient care regarding pain. This kind of gets into a little bit of uh, treatment of chronic pain. Uh, unfortunately, there appear to be a, a lot of physicians who are treating patients with chronic pain with uh, Schedule 3 opioids or hydrocodone combination. In fact, I've heard that some of them won't even use Schedule 2 medications for chronic pain. They insist on using hydrocodone for every patient that, that has a pain need. And obviously, uh, there's a the problem with addiction. But even more important, I think, is the problem of acetaminophen toxicity. Uh, the FDA wants to lower that now. From, from four grams or 4,000 milligrams to less than that. And if you do the math and someone taking something like uh, 750 milligrams per tablet, six tablets you're over that. And I personally have interviewed people taking 40 and 50 tablets a day who are still walking around. Because somehow their body is able to blow by that, which is even minimal. Whereas another person takes that quantity, they're in the hospital emergency room. And you never really know which group you fall into until you walk down that path. It takes years to get to that kind of abuse where you're taking 40 tablets a day. 
but it is possible. And I think at that point, you see the benefit really quickly come up. Okay. Um, we've also seen a big switch down since OxyContin was reformulated. Uh, we're having ever find that as far as use anymore. It's rare. It still is, it still is used, but nothing like what it was. And we'll talk about that in a minute too. Uh, but there's been a complete shift now in what we're seeing. New formula last year. Uh, what, what happened there for the first couple of months, patients called the stores asking if they had the old form. If you got a call like that, you kind of knew what was going on. Um, they would use a cattle shear, peel the cattle. And as you know, it was water soluble, so it could be injected. Uh, of course, it's not that. And the new formula makes a taste for a gel. Um, what's happened though is oxy linear release, oxycodone, IR 30 milligrams, extremely popular. Half of all the oxy IR made this country close to Florida. Broward County probably is the best majority of The other 50%, 55% shared among 49 states. So we're also seeing increases in Opana, especially the Opana ER40 milligram. It's very expensive, uh, but we're seeing more sales. <coughs> and of course, better game with coding. Anybody who's worked in the city knows exactly what I'm talking about. It's called sip and serve, uh, spritz. It's got to be the better game with coding. Usually they get pints. In fact, we were at a store a couple weeks ago that was, uh, was closed for a while. It had 650 pints on hand. They had them lying around the store like little soldiers. Um, they buy it for $10 or $11 a pint, and they're sold for two to $300 a pint. And then the person who buys the pint sells it to individuals on an ounce by ounce basis for $30, $40. So it's a big income producer. If you do a Google search, look on the internet on a purple spritz or turning with coating, you'll see all the all the book about it. And they add things like soda to it. Valley Ranchers, hydrocodone, all kinds of stuff make it more zippy. And as you know, you've got the coating and the promethazine. And they want the purple, they don't want the clear one. Um, we're still working on getting SOMA classified as Schedule 4. So with the feds, this is supposed to have happened a while ago, but once it's a controlled substance, it will be reported mandatory to MAP. So I think it, it's important to look at SOMA use because, first of all, when we had problems with internet pharmacies, they were focusing on research. With Tramadol and Fiorcent. Getting this scheduled will be a big help. And if you see a small amount in the urine screen of Epilbamate, uh, that usually means they have someone because it's metabolized a small part of the body. It's called a conger of Epilbamate. So you'll see that sometimes with little amounts. But it's often mixed with, with opiates such as hydrocodone potentiated. And uh, we had it in maps right now, you'd be surprised at how much you'd see. We've been working on it for about a year now, both with the Board of Pharmacy and on the federal level, uh, to get it scheduled. This, this is something that's needed to be scheduled now for at least 20 years. But um, hopefully once it's scheduled for it, you'll see a lot of maps. I think it will really be a helpful be identifier because it's often abused along with opiates. It kind of potentiates them. And as I said before, if you see a small amount in a urine sample, it usually means, especially with methylvanate, that they've taken chorosoprotal because it's a conger and a small amount is metabolized to methylvanate. Hopefully, we originally said mid-2010, um, which showed you how optimistic we were. But once it's a control substance, now I think 11 or 12 states have already made a control substance, so they do report it to their PFPs. Um, these maps requests, you know, every month I have to update it. Um, this is what we saw in 2010, uh, and at this 1900 a day, we're probably up to about 2500 a day now. Um, the booklet that we sent out, responsible open prescribing, helpful lot, we sent that out about two years ago. And then the DVD that we sent out a few months ago also helped a lot. And for anybody that doesn't know, the DVD does, does have a tutorial on it. Uh, we also have a tutorial on our website. And that's one of the reasons why I don't spend a lot of time going over how to access maps because it's pretty straightforward and it's included in here. Uh, basically, what you need to have is you push your name. Uh, un understandably, and I, I can't explain it, but a lot of people don't seem to know what their license number is. If you are a pharmacist, your license number starts at 53. 5302, 5301 is a pharmacy. If you're an MD, it starts with 43. If you're a DO, it starts with 51. And then if you're a dentist, I think it's 29. But they will put in the wrong license number. They also need their DEA registration, which is two letters and seven numbers. And then the last four digits of their social security number. Unfortunately, a lot of times they'll have an office person do that for them, and the office person will put in the last four digits of their social security number. And then, of course, it hangs up and maps, then we have to deny it because it doesn't match the licensee's social security number because it's a validating factor. Some states require uh, forms to be filled out 
and then notarize and send back to the PMP in order to put people on. We require this online exchange system, but it also requires you have the correct license number, DBA number, and the last four digits of your social. And then that's compared with the database. In fact, every time they log in, or you log into maps, it checks the licensing database to make sure your license is current. So if anything happens to a control substance license, you can let that lapse, or if you're disciplined, you won't be able to get into maps. And that also will happen if you have a controlled substance license that you let lapse. So it's important that you know that. And if you're a practitioner and you have a DEA registration that lapses, it'll be the same problem. It'll come up unavailable to maps. So it's important that you keep your license active because it checks it every time it goes in. And that's something important to remember when someone mentions that they're having a problem. Make sure you go over these problems with them, especially if someone in the office is doing, their, is doing this for them. They're using the correct social security number, license number, and DEA. That's probably uh, a big area where we see issues where people miss numbers, they don't have they don't put the right number of digits in, that sort of thing, or they don't start with the right prefix. So keep that in mind when you go to speak with people, because that's an important issue. Um, if everything goes okay, it doesn't take very long to get in. There are a couple of automated messages that'll get back, and sometimes if they have their spam blocker set real high, they won't get that message back with a temporary password. Well, it comes through a firm known as Tivoli, T W O I. And so that's another problem sometimes people will have. If someone has trouble logging on, or if they have trouble accessing, they can always send us an email, and I'll give you all the information at the end of the presentation. And in, in the worst case scenario, they can also call us. So anyway, uh, as you can see, the use is growing constantly. Now, last year we had almost 19 million prescriptions. I think this year we'll go over 20. Um, Michigan's population has actually declined in the last few years. We're down to a little bit less than 10 million. At one time, we had close to 11 million. We've lost almost a million people in the last seven or eight years. And yet, prescription abuse is going up. Um, hydrocodone, um, give you some facts on that. As you can see, uh, every year pretty much it's gone up. And 2009, it was still a little over 30%. Again, it went up. Uh, it's always gone up more than everything else. 2010, we had 31.3%. Now, if you do the math, Remember, we're talking all prescription schedules two through five. That's everybody. Out of that total of almost 20 million, almost one in three is a hydrocodone combination. That far outpaces everything else. And that's when you add them all together and all the different brand names. So as you can see, we do have a big problem here with hydrocodone. It's used far more than it probably should be. And if the FDA ever does get it scheduled, or DEA gets it scheduled too, it's really going to create some problems. Is that at that point, phone prescriptions are no good, refills are no good, it's going to have to be a unique prescription every time. And I'm just curious to see if that does happen, what the next step would be, what would replace it. Suboxone also has gone way up in the last few years, but that's, that's, I think that's understandable, looking at hydrocodone, because they kind of go hand in hand. And one thing is good that people are getting treatment. I think people are more acceptable of this type of treatment when they go to a physician's office and get treatment, go to the pharmacy and get a prescription filled, rather than having to go to a methadone maintenance center every day for some, for some methadone. They can fill a prescription and they only have to go to the pharmacy once a week, maybe once every three days, depending on how trusting the physician is. The generic for sucking text is my understanding that's going to disappear eventually. Uh, the patent did expire. As you can see, they had a 65% uh, in 2008. Two hundred eighteen thousand in Illinois, almost three hundred thousand in ten. Now they've come out with a film with some other dosage forms, um, so we're seeing the use again go way up. Um, they're also starting to see some some of it showing up in, in addicts <clears throat> when they have what's called a kit. When they when they end up in the ER, a lot of times they'll have this in their kit, and they're not sure whether it's they're they're attempting to get off of it or maybe something they might take if they can't get uh, heroin or whatever drug they, they want. So this is starting to be abused as well. It's showing up where it shouldn't. Uh, my understanding is it's pretty popular in prisons too. Um, schedule two data again, um, you know, large increases. Oxy IR, this is for a ten. Uh, it's thirty thirty two thousand. I think uh, in eleven we'll probably see that increase about tenfold, and I think we'll see the oxy decrease. Pain benefits. And this is where I, I think we really need to get grounded. Is we talk about pain experts say as many as twenty percent, and that might be a little bit high. It might be a little bit low, I don't know. But when we talk about 20% here, we're talking about all kinds of diversion, whether they're seeing two different doctors, uh, whether they're suffering from um, pseudo addiction, which is supposedly uh, 
some of them are not getting adequate pain treatment. So their behavior mimics addiction as they go to different doctors to get treatment for their pain. Once they get the treatment they need, that pseudo addiction goes away, they stop doctor shopping. So that's also included in that 20%. So you're in two, anywhere from two doctors to 27 doctors, there's a wide variance here. The important thing to remember though is if you turn that number around, that means that 80% of the patients aren't doing any doctor shopping. They're compliant, they're good. And I think that at some point that's gonna be the biggest use of these PMPs, prescription management programs, to identify the honest patients because they're the majority and make sure that they get the care that they need. The care that they deserve and need and want. Um, because if anybody's ever going to pay for a period of time, uh, you have no idea how debilitating that can be. It becomes your entire focus. Everything you do is concerned with that pain, how to alleviate it, how to deal with it. 24-7, uh, that becomes your problem. It's hard to sleep, you can't eat. There's absolutely no enjoyment in life. So it's important that we recognize that most patients are honest and we treat them as such. Everybody's not a criminal. So just remember that most patients are honest, four out of five at least, maybe higher. NASPR was the national law that kind of mimics uh, the MAPS law. It passed in 2005. They did pass some funding finally. And we did receive about 200,000 for two years in a row. And what we did was we created a patient intervention program in the Olympics in Washington County where we would provide oversight. What we did was we went through MAPS reports. We identified patients who were seeing the low end of the conversion scale, uh, two, three, four, five doctors. We would run the report. And then we would contact their treating physicians to see if we could get them referred into a substance abuse program if they were addicted. We had a social worker that would work with them with the primary care physician. Medicaid would pay for the treatment if it was a Medicaid recipient, and we would follow the patient up to a year. And then we were able to continue that uh, last year. The program ended September 30th because um, NASPR lost their funding from the budget cuts. Um, we saw a lot of Medicaid recipients who were doctor shopping, especially in Western Lane County. The thing that Medicaid doesn't see though, is they don't see their other drug use. They only see what they pay for, and that's true of most insurance companies. Uh, it's when they run their entire report that it's really an eye opener because uh, Medicaid is only paying for a small portion. They're using other kinds of insurance, they're paying cash. Uh, it really jumps right out you after you look at a few reports. And we'll cover that too a little bit later. So anyway, we, we were able to uh, we looked at 104 Western Wayne County patients that we saw who were obviously doing some doctor shopping, um, and 95 were doctor shopping. So it shows you how prevalent it can be uh, in those areas. The top one had 17 paid by Medicaid, but the report was 50 pages long, and there's about seven scripts on a page. So that's 350 scripts. That's five scripts a day. So Medicaid is only paying for a small portion of it. But where Medicaid does end up paying for things, such as the ER visits, when they don't see the prescription that's tied to it, they'll pay for the ER visit, not the prescription. Uh, multiple methods of payment. We saw Blue Cross, Medicare, Pharmacy Benefit Managers, which is PDM, and of course cash. And again, Medicaid only sees what they pay for. And it's the same with Blue Cross and the other insurers. We don't give them data other than Medicaid. So they only see what they pay for. We did have some contacts with some of the health plans, which is the managed care for Medicaid. Um, however, most of the shoppers were in the managed care plans, not straight Medicaid. Uh, we only had one patient with direct Medicaid that we were looking at. And eventually we opened the program up to everybody, not just Medicaid. Um, we also took referrals from drug courts, uh, child protective services, and others. Uh, we would have liked to have expanded to Lansing, and we've asked for additional funding. Uh, so far we haven't heard, but at one time, we had about 15 patients who were old, which doesn't seem like a lot, but you've got to realize that for every patient who's uh, old for substance abuse, there's probably another 20 or 30 people that are indirectly or directly affected. They're family members, their employer. They usually have legal issues, work issues, money issues. So it involves much more than just this one person. And at a very minimum, it's their immediate family, their friends, because generally people are in this group are they pretty much take advantage of everybody. Now, we also had complaints that in some of the cities it was hard to find certain Schedule II drugs. So we went and surveyed all the pharmacies about two years ago and we created a database within MAPS uh, where we have all the pharmacies that have certain drugs, drugs that they selected that they stock. As long as you're a registered MAPS user, you can access that database. We just ask that you not print it up and distribute it. Um, and like I say, there's 30% of Michigan practitioners are currently um, 
as users. But you also have to remember that not every practitioner is really going to have a use for maps. Obviously, a radiologist probably doesn't need the four reports. A pediatrician may not, or OBGYN very often either. Um, our next step will be to run a report and put in a program to see exactly how many practitioners did write a controlled substance prescription in a year, and then use that as the top number rather than how many are licensed. Because right now we're using how many are licensed, and that may not give us a true picture. I think that if we look at how many actually write scripts versus how many run maps reports, this number will be quite a bit higher. It won't be 30, it'll probably be at least 50. And you know, there's a lot of reasons why people don't pull maps reports as well. Okay, some of the things that you need to do, and this is the law, written numerical terms. We get questions on that all the time. If you just write one zero, it will get changed into one zero zero. Now, if this is an electronic prescription, then it really doesn't matter. But if it's a written prescription, it's gotta be in both terms. And we've recently learned that some of the insurance carriers are not paying when they find these kinds of prescriptions that don't have it in, in, both, in both terms. So you might want to clarify that with a physician when you get one. Don't use the stamp or anyone else to sign your name. People do that a lot. They let somebody else sign their name. Or they'll pre-sign prescriptions that are blank, which causes all kinds of problems for them. Again, shouldn't really be doing that. Um, protecting patients, respond to red flags. Everybody know what a red flag is? Anybody who's been practicing for more than about a month has probably seen one. I lost my medication. My dog ate it. It fell in the toilet. Oh, your blood pressure? No, no. The other one. Special. I lost that one. Uh, somebody was staying with me and they stole it. I mean, all kinds of strange excuses. I don't have any money, but I'm going on vacation for six months. All kinds of red flags. When you hear those red flags, right away you should think to yourself, I need to check. I need to verify. I need to validate. And, you know, other things I can do. First of all, I have to keep good records. You know what you did last month. You can do the contracts, urine screens, all that sort of stuff. Chronic patients avoid hydrocodone. I mean, obviously, sometimes you may have to use it. There's always exceptions. Um, methadone, long half life, right? Day, day and a half. So if they want to make a dosage change, they have to wait at least a week after they've started a patient. Methadone is here to stay, folks, because it only costs about two or three cents a tablet. That's cheap. That's why it's so popular. And it, and, it, and it can be effective in pain. It's just that the people who tend to have the problems with it are the patients. It's usually someone that stole it, someone they sold it to, or someone they gave it to. They don't understand it's, it's got a small induction, long half-life. So that what happens is they take too much when they mix it with something else like alcohol, or especially a benzodiazepine, like a lipid, lipid, uh, lipid soluble, such as um, alprazolam. And by the time they do feel something, it's too late. So it's important to remind people that they don't have a very long half-life. Be careful when you prescribe it. Now, this is the book we everybody a couple years ago. Scott Fishman's. There's supposed to be a newer edition coming out later this year. We'll get some of them. I don't know how many. And I'm not sure if we'll be able to distribute that again because it's expensive. But the important thing that I like about this book and that we need to remember is typically in a hospital, they talk about how is your pain on a 1 to 10 scale. Of course, that leaves someone open to say, well, it's, it's 11. My question is, well, it's 11. I really don't understand how you arrive at that, but obviously some people will say that. Um, this book up here, though, this is it's a measure of functionality. If you were in chronic pain before and you couldn't move around, and now you're getting treatment and you can play golf, then that's an improvement. Your functionality has improved. That's measurable. The thing about I was in pain before at an 8, but now I'm a 7, that's difficult to measure. And what a lot of people don't realize is, it's not always possible to make your pain go completely away. Pain specialists consider a success if they reduce your pain by 50%. So if you have a 10 and now you have a 5, that's a success. Unfortunately, a lot of people think that the pain should be completely eliminated, and that may not be possible. But if we can lower it, lower the threshold, get them to do more function, that's a success that they can do more activities than they did before. And that's what's important to remember about this one. I mean, obviously it doesn't solve all the problems, and it only looks at the drug modality for pain, and we all know that there's other ways of treating pain. But we're focusing on the drugs here because that's what this is. NAPS is drug related, so is this book. But remember, there are other ways to treat pain, it's just medications. The one for 10 scale. Um, the DVD has a lot of interviews on how to treat pain. It, like I said before, it also has um, the tutorial and a list of and we've got a lot more if anybody needs them. Um, over one hour of instructions, it was mailed uh, back in 11. And you know, 
We're also approaching the medical boards and the board of pharmacy as updating our pain standards. Uh, currently, what we have now is at least 10 or 15 years old, and it really doesn't speak to chronic pain. It speaks more to terminal or acute pain, which is much different than chronic pain. Uh, 15 years ago, really, chronic pain wasn't addressed at all. It's only become, if anybody's been around practicing more than uh, 15, 20 years, you remember when all we really had was Percocet, Percodan, Dilaudid. That was it. And then suddenly they started showing up things like MS cotton, uh, methadone, and then oxycontin. Oxy all these other drugs only showed up in the last 10 or 15 years. Prior to that, there really wasn't much for pain. Now, here's a couple of, um, I've taken out the name, but I just wanted to point out, after you look at a few of these, they kind of jump right out at you, uh, what, where the problems are. And I just want to point out, this is the patient's state of birth. Um, this is the original day of the prescription. This is the day it was filled. Obviously, sometimes it's the same. You can probably tell what the drug is. Um, prescription number, physician, and then in the middle here, though, this is really the first area I look at. Look for consistency, because here you see private pay, commercial premium, that could have been Blue Cross or one of the Medicaid providers. Private pay means cash. But you see the pattern here. Similar drugs, different physicians. Um, oh, look at their Lansing, too. Um, different pharmacies. Again, this is a, this is a typical the typical pattern you'll see with um, with a doctor shopper. And sometimes it's large quantities, 180. Sometimes it's smaller. But it's, it's typically the timeline is inappropriate. They're getting large amounts just several days apart. And again, when you look at the total picture, it, uh, this kind of just jumps right out at you. Here's another one, um, more from the Detroit area. One of the things that happens too with doctor shoppers is you'll see that the chain pharmacies all stop filling their scripts. And there'll be a couple of smaller independents, kind of like in, in maybe the urban areas at will. And those are the thought pharmacies that we tend to focus on too, because sometimes they're, they're not really doing their due diligence as far as scripts. But again, it's the same pattern. Patients born at 65. Now, praise the lamb. The Medicaid tells us that the top two drugs that they pay for are hydrocodone and praise the lamb. And when you look at these types of patients, You'll notice that when you look at the appraisal line, it's always the 2 or the 1 milligram. It's never the 0.25 or the 0.5. And 2 milligrams only has uh, one accepted medical use. There's your kind of game with coding. They, they got a pint. Um, then they got an appraisal lamp. I did code on again. There's some oxy. But this is from 2010 before they changed it. There again, you've got high amounts of appraisal line, 2 milligram, different positions, different pharmacies. Medicaid, method of payment, again, private pay, Medicaid, Blue Cross. Here's a patient that's a little bit younger, born in 1981. Similar pattern, different insurances, but I want you to make note of this and then look at the next slide I'm going to show you because this, the next slide is going to be the same patient. Same patient as this one. But watch what happens. Look at the difference. Same physician, same pharmacy. There's a few different drugs, but they don't clash. That the payment stays pretty consistently too. This patient is getting treatment. But you see the difference? They're, they're legitimate, but you don't see that, you don't see them bouncing all around, different doctors and pharmacies. You don't see different methods of payment. And you see a regimen that actually makes some sense. You know, clonazepam with suboxone, it, it ends up. Unfortunately, we just don't see this very often. But this is what the more legitimate ones look like. And I can say, after you've looked at a few of these, and if you looked at as many as I have, they jump right out at you. You don't need to spend a lot of time with that. Especially, too, if you're going to pull up, and we give you a 15 month report when you're doing that. If that report is 20 pages long, you know without looking at it, there's going to be a problem. Most people might have a legitimate patient, might have three or four pages, but obviously, there's certain things that do jump out. And everybody's different. You have to really, you have to really keep an open mind when you look at this because. To every rule, there's always exceptions. Now, I want to show you this because this is this is one of our surveys, and this is returned by that physician I told you earlier about that didn't want to be responsible. But if you look at that and you look at his questions, I'm sorry I couldn't get a better copy here. But basically, what he says is, it's asked you, you know, have you treated this patient? Um, what did you do? Are you seeing him? Is it your script? And what are you going to do in the future? And he pretty much says he's not going to do anything. Nothing. He's not going to do anything. Then he goes on to say that he's busy and he's got a lot of responsibility and that we should be contacting the patient, telling their doctor shopping and insurance and all that. 
Well, what he's done here, though, is we've notified him of a patient who's committing a felony. They're an actor shop. And he turned around and told us he's not going to do anything. You know, I mean, it's one thing not to do anything. It's another to write a letter back to the state and tell him you're not going to do anything. And he didn't just do it once. He did it again. It is not the medical doctor's responsibility to police the health care system. And you may run into someone like this when you go out. You're going to have to have some answers for that. And my answer would be, you're helping them commit insurance fraud, drug diversion, and now you're culpable too. You become a part of the problem now. You're not a solution. You know, if you don't feel that's your responsibility, then you shouldn't be treating these patients. But he is treating those patients. He's not doing anything. And he tells us it's our job. Well, obviously it's not our job, it's his job. And we're going to have to remind him of that. But that's some of the things you run into with the public and with practitioners. They all have different ideas of what's, what's appropriate. So he sent us the second one, which is a little more clear. He said, none. Nothing, not going to do anything. And again, but it's not his responsibility. And then he cited Dr. Pepper. Data sharing. Anytime we go near the border, um, we're always asked, you know, I have to, if I have a patient that goes to Ohio, Michigan, I have to go to ORS, which is the Ohio system, O A R R S, Ohio Automated Records and Prescription Records. It's the same thing as MAPS. And it's true. If you have a patient that goes across state lines, you have to sign up for two and three systems. And the problem with ours is because we use a licensing database, if you're not a Michigan licensee, you can't do it online. You have to fax us a request, and then we have to fax the answer back to you. And that's labor and time intensive. Well, pretty soon, and we just started some of the testing in the last couple of weeks, uh, NABP, National Association of Board of Pharmacy, with a grant from Purdue Pharma, is setting up a data hub. And that's put up by a PRE. A PRE, A-P-P-R-I-S-S. They're the same folks that put together the hub, the, the data net network system for a federal reporting from the chain. It's going to be good to go. It's already been uh, Indiana, I think, in Virginia, and Ohio. We're starting to share data about a month ago. We're going to be testing it in December, and I hope to have a slide by the end of the year so that you can log on to maps, and you can check Indiana, Ohio, and probably Virginia initially. And then gradually, we'll add other states as well as what other states do. Most states, when they start the program for their PMP, they're not doing data sharing initially. It takes them a while to get their system working good internally before they can reach out to other states. Luckily, we've been doing it now for about eight years, so we've had a lot of experience. Um, and it's not easy getting the hookup, because every state's system is a little bit different. They have different vendors who design their system. They use different types of software. Uh, and you don't really realize the differences in the team try to communicate. And at the same token, any communication has to be encrypted. It has to be secure. And the way we're going to set up our reports is that if you get data from Ohio, it will not be a separate report. It will be interspersed between the Michigan data so that it's on a chronological timeline. It makes it much easier to read. You won't have to look the page to page figure where they fit in. So you might see a prescription from the Lansing position on the 5th, then you might see something on the 8th from a position in Ohio, and that'll all be interspersed. But you will see the different addresses, you'll see the different positions, and you'll see the different pharmacies all listed. And we do put addresses up there. Uh, I would put phone numbers if I could, but I just don't have that information available to give you but I can't give you the address. And we strongly encourage anyone who sees this type of activity to let the other practitioners know. Even if it's just a letter or a phone call, let them know what's going on so that perhaps uh, together you can do something to, to deal with the patient effectively rather than just shut them off. Anyway, I'm really excited about this because they're also going to let the dates, the different states form a governance committee to govern the house so that we can get what we need out of that system. And they've also talked about some other things that we're using. And they've been very positive, and they've managed to set this up in less than six months. Whereas the other hub that's been set up through the feds with grant money called IDIS, they've been working on that for five years, and they just got it running a couple weeks ago. So we're going to go with an EVP. It's going to be more effective, faster, and it's free. Eventually, though, they would like to collect data. That's going to be one way of paying for it. They want to leverage it with chains. In other words, if you work for a large chain, when you bring up that patient's profile, the chain this your computer will have already logged into the database. So that as you look at that prescription on the right hand side of the screen, you'll see their match report. It'll be automatic. They want to do the same thing with hospital ERs. Same with the hospitals. They all go into these, these um, EMR, electronic medical records. You don't want to have to log in and log out of different systems. You want to log in once and see everything. 
and that will be the next step. It will be in the EMR, it will be in the hospital, it will be in the ER. So when you bring up your profile, everything is right there. And then they want to look at uh, running these reports automatically or change, but also adding non control drugs. And you know, it seems a little strange, but when you think about it, it does make some sense. And anytime there's a natural disaster, it would be nice to have a database that would have all your prescriptions on it. I mean, it's already got the important stuff, right? Control substances. But what if you went to the ER and you weren't conscious? Wouldn't you like to take a look up your, see if you were on Coumadin? I would. I mean, they already know your other stuff. You might not add everything else. And that's what they're talking about. Maybe at some point adding everything to it for emergencies, disasters, and if someone has an emergency such as the ER. Because remember, this isn't something everybody can get to. It's restricted just like it is now. It's just some thoughts that the NABP has. And they shared it with us, and I'm sharing it with you. And I'm not saying it's all a good thing. I'm just saying that this is some of the options that we'll connect to the future. Um, you know, electronic scripture, getting very close. The media has approved from platforms. Uh, pharmacies also have to get vetted. Um, it's going to be a two-factor identification. There's actually three different ways of identifying a person. One is what you know. Another is what you have. And the third is who you are. I think Myers is using that digital identifier now in the pharmacies where you put your thumb into a, into a reader and it identifies you digitally as to who you are. If you carry a fob, it's what you have, sort of a key card, like when you go to the bank. If you're punching your pin, that's what you know. With your card, that's what you have. They want at least that for electronic prescriptions in two factor. And that's kind of held everything up because you've got to get everybody vetted. They're going to try to do it through some hospitals. They were originally going to ask the state medical boards and so forth to do it, but the states don't have the resources. Um, now that the platforms are starting up and running, they'll start looking at the, at the different vendors and the stores. And I really think that the electronic prescriptions will help us tremendously because it'll eliminate some of the phone calls, it'll eliminate some of the diversion. And also, with the newest version of uh, ASAP, American Society for Automation and Pharmacy, this is the software that, we, that you reported. We just upgraded to 4.1 this year. Well, 4.1 will allow electronic scripts to be recorded directly after dispensing. So when the pharmacy digitally signs a prescription, they can forward it right to us. We don't have to wait a week or two weeks or whatever it is now. And by the way, with the new rules, it's going to be weekly. But this also will allow the pharmacy to correct the prescription. If you fill a prescription and then the patient doesn't show up, and two weeks later you're putting it back in stock. Now, I know that doesn't happen very often with controlled substances, but it does happen occasionally. The 4.1 will allow you to go back and pull a prescription back out of the database. Now we'll be looking at that every month to see if the last scripts are pulled out or not or if they're altered because obviously someone can do something they shouldn't. But it gives you the option of being able to fix a mistake as well. And that's important because occasionally the most prevalent mistake in that is the wrong DBA number being reported. Using drop down menus, the monomic codes, it's easy to report the wrong position, especially with someone with the same name. And you may have 10 Dr. Smiths, especially if you're in an urban area, and it's very easy to pull the wrong one down and then it gets reported by the wrong DEA number. Then that doctor Smith looks at the report of the patient, he says, I didn't prescribe that. What's going on? And they call us to complain, and we tell them, we get a little at the pharmacy and complain because they're the ones that submitted their own data. Well, this will allow the pharmacy to go back and fix that. It doesn't happen a lot, but some people get very concerned when they see that. Generally though, when you see this kind of error, the prescription was dispensed, it was given to the right patient because otherwise it wouldn't have been paid for. What's happened here is it's the wrong identifier for the practitioner. And sometimes they take that very personal. Especially if they belong to an HMO. Because sometimes they're giving credit for that. They're going to be charged back for it and they didn't prescribe it. Um, and that's the problem with some of the Medicaid issues now. You know, when, when patients doctor shop, when they go to different ER visits every weekend, um, resources are diminished. Uh, they may not pay for the prescription if the patient is locked in, but they still pay for the ER visit which can be expensive, maybe some tests, um, no dispensing, they pay for office visits. Uh, sometimes what they'll do is they'll pay cash, they'll conceal the fact that they're a Medicaid recipient. And so the doctor almost never knows. Um, even when they're locked in, just because they're locked in doesn't mean they can't go somewhere else. As long as they don't tell them they have Medicaid. Everybody takes cash, right? Other methods of payment. And then they also use more social and addiction services. And of course, that, that diminishes the resources for all the other patients. Um, you might want to know too that a new, new law was passed in Ohio last year. It mandates the board to create rules for a prescription management program, wonderful reports. When there's evidence of diversion, 
respond to red flags, which we'll talk about. And four is uh, the PMP for Ohio. They will be communicating with MAPS prior to the end of the year. Other states will be involved as well. This is the tip of the iceberg, because what's happening is, as states aren't using their PMP, as we're having trouble getting practitioners, and we probably made more efforts to enroll practitioners than just about every other state. We spent a lot of money on educating with the pamphlets, with the booklets, and we still only had, what, 50% or less? Other states have even less than that. They might only have 10 or 20%. So what's going to happen eventually is someone's going to mandate it. The problem is the people who make the laws, they're not health professionals. They're not going to look at it at the same point of view as you. They're going to say something draconian like, you have to pull it every time before you write a prescription. And then what happens is, it doesn't happen. The patient shows up at the pharmacy in the evening when they can't get their prescription filled because somebody didn't pull a mask report. And so the patient suffers in the end. Ultimately, that's who always suffers. And so what we're trying to do is get the medical board, the pharmacy board, to update their pain guidelines so that we can use masks when it's appropriate. Now, I'm not saying we need to pull it every time, but I think we all know the circumstances under which we should be pulling for us. First time use, it's a new patient, we should pull it in. You never know. I can tell you the pain specialists always look at it for a new patient. Pull it the couple days before they come. That way nobody's kept away. And also, when you have your first visit, you start off on the right foot. You know exactly where everybody stands. Because people will often deny diversion until you show up in front of report. And then it's kind of hard to say it wasn't me. Now they'll call us sometimes and say, someone stole my ID. And we'll ask, well, what did they steal? Well, they stole my blue cross card. They're looking for different prescription to pretend they need. Well, generally, if you're going to steal the right, they're going to steal their credit cards, not their insurance cards. But we do hear those kinds of stories from people. <coughs> and as long as you have all the other steps in place, you have a signature and file, who picked up the prescription, you check your ID, right? You know who that person is. You've got a vetted and identified in the system. It's kind of hard for them to say it wasn't me. The other reason is, if we have good data, and when you pull that report, we can be assured that we're giving you good data, the right data, and the right patient. So it all goes in steps. Make sure we have the right patient, the right drug, the right date, the right doctor, the right pharmacy, so that when you pull the data back, you get good data. Because if you give us garbage, we're going to give you the garbage back, and it's not going to work well. So make sure that you do all those steps. That you find out who they are, make sure you identify them, and you only have to do it once if you don't know who they are. Okay, so eventually, if we don't take these steps, and there's already been legislation introduced several times in Michigan to do that, and I've read it. And I can tell you, it would not be kind to pharmacists or physicians. Not at all. It would be mandatory. So that's why we're pushing these programs. If we, if we can make this a practice standard and do it on our own, we won't have the legislature telling us how to do it. Doctor shoppers, as you know, um, we're looking at six or more. But you know, sometimes we get calls, especially from family members. They'll say, you know, I've got a son or a daughter or a sister or brother, and I know they're going to the doctors, and I'm really concerned. What can you do? Well, you know what? If, if, that, if that happens, have them send us something secure, like an email to MAPS info. All we need is the name of the patient, the date of birth, and the address. We will pull the report, and if they are doctor shopping, we'll notify the doctors, even if they're not hitting six. <clears throat> as long as we've got something that we can stand back and say, they appear to be doctor shopping, we'll let them know. Because you're going to come across this. We get calls all the time. And what we try to do is at least work with the family. Sometimes it's a practitioner and another health professional. Just have them email us at MAPS info. Um, now, here's some of the other things, too. What MAPS does not use? First of all, it's a lack of knowledge. Well, everybody usually claims that. I didn't know right there. Um, there's also some false beliefs. And we had one doctor who told us he didn't use it because it cost too much. I'd like to add, though, that he also told us he'd been practicing medicine for 50 years. So I did the math. I figured maybe, maybe he'd hit the end of the road here. Um, false beliefs, time consuming, sad. A lot of practitioners seem to think that they have to personally get on it and pull the report. Not true. They can have their staff do the pull the reports. Same in the pharmacy. You can have a technician that you trust pull the report. Yes, you have to share your password with them. <coughs> yes, everything is tracked. We can go back and see who pulled what report. So you want to make sure that it's someone you trust. But you don't have to do it yourself. Uh, laziness. Some of them just don't want to be bothered. I mean, I've had people complain that they don't want to put their DNA number on a prescription. It makes me wonder how they got through college. Um, stubborn, especially with older practitioners. They'll say, you know, I practiced for so many years, I never had it, why do I need it now? Well, 
Let me tell you why you didn't know, because you have a lot of drugs out there now that you didn't have 20 years ago. And so in the past, it was that long. These people are good. Studies have shown the best you can catch is about half of them. And the fact that they can get a prescription for 180 like that, they probably do have some sort of a medical issue. The only problem is they don't get it treated. And they also shop dentists. People will shop dentists. They get smaller amounts, but they shop them. It's usually the phone call in the middle of the night. They get a small amount, and they all show up the next day. <coughs> Stubborn. Fear. Fear that if they pull the report and see something that they don't like, they're going to actually have to do something about it. Because the truth is, these patients show dinner and extra reimbursement in their time consumption. I mean, if you're, if you're, it's the same with the filling a prescription. If you, if you fill a prescription that takes you three minutes and you do 300 a day, you're going to make more money than you have to spend a half an hour on the prescription. It's the same with patients. You know, these are time consuming patients, lack of reimbursement. It's easier to push them through and not pull the match report. But we have to change that thinking so that they realize that it, it does have value pulling that report and value for the patient. <coughs> now, the surveys we get back, we do look at them. A lot of times they drop the patient. Here's what's really interesting is sometimes they'll say, yes, I'm aware of masks, but I don't use masks. So we're going back and contacting them to get a response as to why. Is there something maybe that we need to clarify in Is there something we need to do or explain? Uh, is there some, some sort of false feeling you have about the program? Maybe something you're not aware of that we can convince you to use it? Because I'd really like to know why. If someone has a free database, a free system they can use, it takes minutes to use, why would you use it? It just it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. We also get <clears throat> physicians who return dozens of surveys. And then we have to ask, well, why are the shoppers still going with it? They're returning dozens of surveys saying they're using maps. Because obviously, if you're using the maps, we shouldn't have the doctor shoppers going with it. Again, month after month, we're sending these letters out, giving back these same answers. So we're following up on that as well, to figure out what's going on. But we get a lot of strange answers back. Um, also, occasionally, people will contact us with a lot of health professional with prescribing and spending issues. And I think there seems to be like everybody in, in certain towns, there seems to be one, and everybody knows who that person is, but everybody's afraid to say anything. Well, the law does require that we have complaints in writing. Uh, and we can keep the complaint if that's the person who complains, confidential, unless there's a hearing. Uh, usually at that point, though, whoever complained about it, the least of their worries, they go to a hearing. Because now they've got some real problems with their, with their license. Um, and then, of course, at that point, they may be, that may get the balls when we release the report to discover it. An email works for us. Uh, no telephone calls open because it's, it's not official. <clears throat> and it's also easy to say something over the phone. If you have to ask them to put your name to something, it's a little more, a little more solid. So let us know. I mean, if you want to send it to me directly, here's my private email with the state. You can also send it to MAPS info. But as you're out there talking to people, you probably will get people who complain about it different practitioners, pharmacy physicians. Let us know. We'll take a look at it. That's what we do. We investigate health professionals for the various benefits. And MAPS is in part of the pharmacy section, which is within the health investigation division. That's what we do. And also, the pharmacy inspectors are tied very closely to this. They have access to data, not directly, but through, through the program. And they can ask for these reports uh, if, if someone does actually come and complain. <clears throat> just, just because we get a complaint doesn't mean we're going to do anything, but we can look at it. We always follow up. Um, <clears throat> and you know, contents of the packet, I think we talked about that. It's a key message. It's a resource. I think you're all going to get the U of M clinical guidelines for managing pain. And then the responsible opioid prescribing. Everybody gets that. Feedback forms. And also, we've got stuff on our website. If you go to our MAPS website, we have tutorials, we have um, the regulations, we have QA, we also have uh, data. We have a spell spreadsheet for the last five years, all the different drugs, increases, decreases, what's moved, what hasn't. And then we also have data by zip code. If someone wants to put together a report on what's being dispensed around the state, it's based on the zip code of the patient. So feel free to go to our website, uh, use the packet. Uh, I think the most important thing to get out here is that there is a system where we can validate patients and we can do it quietly. Uh, nobody knows. Okay, so we know that this PMP, Prescription Reminder Form of the State of Michigan, identified drug diversion at the prescriber pharmacy and patient level by collecting schedules to the five data. It's as simple as that. All the retail prescriptions go into the database, reported electronically, 
Right now, it's every two weeks. Um, when we get the next board rule set in place, it'll be weekly. But with electronic prescriptions, it could be daily. Online registration required. Um, recently, uh, Reddy just gave their employees home access to the web page. Uh, you have to register from home, but once you have a registration for Mass, if you work for Reddy, you can access it directly from the store. And that's been part of the promise in the past. Some of this has changed. We're not giving our pharmacists access to the database. And so we would have to do it with a facsimile, which of course is a lot of work for everybody. And once you have the online access, it doesn't take long to run. Even if you're in the pharmacy, you should see a red flag with a patient. You should still run a report. Don't rely on us to do it for you. Don't rely on the physician to do it for you. Pull your own reports, too. Because uh, there's a lot of different things out there. And you need to keep yourself aware of what's happening. And you know, there's, there's more than one way to handle it, too, if you have to decline the church. And you, you can do it with a little bit of good judgment. Routinely prescribing, if a new patient uh, you've never seen before, especially if they're asking for a controlled substance by name, now, if you're a pain specialist and they're referred to you, obviously they're going to have an idea of what works for them. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the family practitioner where this is the first time the patient has seen a physician as far as you know, and they're asking for a specific drug. That's usually considered to be a red flag. You should at least check. Um, also, you know, filling uh, how long it's been, uh, multiple providers, and plus two, sometimes you'll hear what they don't want you to hear, so they want it to say certainly like lots in 385, or it's got to be kind of again, it's the purple color. Those are all things that make you stop and think twice. State of Michigan, uh, we're now the Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs, Bureau of Health Professions. We are the Health Investigation Division. Here's our maps info at Michigan.gov email. Here's a phone number if all else fails. Um, business hours, 373-1737. Here's our website and, and everything else. Hopefully this you need to know.